All right, so we stopped um, on Wednesday in lecture talking about the genetics of coat color. And we used dogs as a major example. Um, and there's, just to review very quickly, there's actually seven different loci that can determine color patterns in um, some of our mammals. So the agouti gene, the black gene, albino gene, dilution gene, extension gene, spotting gene, and ticking gene. So in each one of these genes actually has um, at least two um, and sometimes more different alleles they can dictate whether um, pigment is, um, or a spotting pattern actually exists uh, in, <clears throat> uh, in a dog. So um, our Labrador retrievers are gonna usually have this coloring genotype so keep in mind that starting with the agouti gene and going all the way down to the ticking gene this would be the lab a black labs um, genotype for coat for color so they have a solid black pigment which is the agouti gene dictates their color is fu uh, fully expressed there's intense pigmentation uh, the color is fully extended into the full follicle shaft, and there's no spots and no ticking. So keep in mind, no ticking um, is where you see a recessive genotype for that last loci. Our beagles are uh, quite a bit different in their genotype, so the agouti gene actually will dictate saddle markings in beagles. Uh, they will also... Um, have black pigment that it will be produced. The color will be fully expressed in that saddle pattern. There's very intense pigmentation. Um, and then uh, deviation from the labs is the beagles will have piebald uh, spotting, so big spots. Um, and then there will be absolutely no ticking. So again, similar to the Labradors, um, with the ticking gene, there's going to be a recessive genotype there too. And then finally, our Dalmatians have this type of um, genotype where we see solid black pigment. The black, um, the black pigment um, is actually going to be produced fully. There's intense pigmentation. The locus is expressed throughout. Um, and then there's extreme piebald spotting throughout the entire body, um, accompanied with major ticking, which is indicative of a, heteros or a homozygous dominant genotype. So there's a really great table in your book um, that gives the breed of dogs their usual um, genes and their genotypes, and then some of the other genes that may be present within the breed as well. All right, so let's switch gears. We're going to talk about some of the interactions that we see between sex of an organism and heredity of genes and expression of those genes. So um, the effect of sex hormones on gene expression are pretty broad. Um, one of the big ones is balding. So um, especially in males, balding doesn't really show up until after puberty. Um, so that's... Um, really an indication in earlier scientific studies that balding was um, some sort of interaction with testosterone and after doing um, studying many different inheritance patterns that's what they actually ended up finding. So on another note um, the beard um, that goats have is also a trait that is sex influenced. So if a goat has a beard, then um, that's going to be determined by an autosomal gene. And that gene is a big B with a little b subscript. And this gene is going to be dominant in males, but it's going to be recessive in females. So even though it can show up in both males and females, because of the sex, it's going to be expressed differently. So, for example, here in our um, beardless male, we're going to cross it with a bearded female that has um, a homozygous genotype. And um, in the F1 generation, we're going to get two heterozygous individuals, as we would normally expect in our dominance recessive patterns. But here, because of the, the influence of this gene and uh, the interaction with sex, the males are going to have a beard and the females are not, even though their genotypes are absolutely the same. 
So males are going to, um, again, going to carry one copy. Um, and even if they carry one copy, um, they're going to show that genotype or that phenotype of the beard, um, even if they only have that one allele. And in females, it ends up being recessive. So she can have two copies of the gene to be bearded. So uh, males only need one copy. Females have to have two copies. All right, so just uh, looking at another inheritance pattern, if we allow those two goats with the heterozygous um, genotypes to intermate in the F1 generation, the F2 generation is going to break down like we see here in the bottom of the slide so that our heterozygotes actually behave uh, differently depending upon gender. So it's important to determine um, gender ratios as well when you're giving answers to questions because they're not the genotype is not always going to be the same um, among both both sexes. So back to or revisiting um, sex influence traits again in male pattern baldness. Um, this is actually determined by an autosomal allele that is dominant in males, but it is recessive in females. Therefore, be, um, but it's also a trait that is not X-linked, so it's not on the X chromosome. So if we look at this um, inheritance pattern here, uh, we see John Adams, who was our second president of the U.S., his son John Quincy Adams, and then John Quincy Adams' son Charles Francis. They all have balding patterns. So this trait is autosomal, meaning that the gene is actually contained on autosomes. Men and women are going to inherit these genes much differently, um, just based on sex. And in order for male pattern baldness to be expressed, men only need one copy to be bald. However, women need two copies to express any type of phenotype. And usually that phenotype isn't extreme um, balding, but you will have a dramatic thinning of hair. So, and then um, to make um, things a little more complicated, the balding phenotype is actually going to be enhanced by uh, the presence of testosterone. So we really start to see balding beginning to take place after an individual has gone through puberty. So male pattern baldness is where um, the testosterone that is going to be produced um, from the testicles is going to be converted to dihydrotestosterone or DHT and the enzyme that does that cons or conversion process is called 5-alpha reductase. So DHT, um, which is the end product of that conversion process, will actually um, or actually has the ability to kill your hair follicles. So DHT is the major issue here. It isn't necessarily um, testosterone, but you have to have DHT in order to get the conversion to testosterone. So there's been quite a bit of science done um, coming up with cures for male pattern baldness. You guys have all heard of Rogaine. There's also um, Proceptal, um, which is a, a, a pill that can actually be consumed on a prescription basis. And, base, and both of these uh, mechanisms, whether you use the shampoo and conditioner or take actually a pill, will inhibit the 5-alpha reductase and reduce the production of DHT, which will reduce the, uh, the baldness um, and the killing of the follicles. So um, there's one of the jokes that goes around about male pattern baldness is there's actually a treatment for it, um, but it's not recommended and it's not widely used and it's actually uh, castration. So um, if you're if you want or if you're completely concerned and don't want to lose hair, then castration is the solution for you, but it is not recommended. All right, so some of the extremes that we see um, from the sex influence traits are usually going to be encoded by autosomal genes, and um, these traits are going to be only expressed to an extreme in one gender. 
and usually there's going to be zero penetrance or zero expression in the other gender. We can see variations of that, especially with balding, because um, some women, if they have two copies of that gene, they will actually exhibit thinning, but it's still not as extreme as balding. All right, so some of the sex-limited characteristics that we um, also see in livestock species is the feathering patterns in um, in cocks. So a female is um, typically going to have the genotypes of um, or the homozygous dominant genotype or a heterozygous genotype, um, whereas the male. Um, if they display the homozygous recessive genotype, they're going to get extreme feathering patterns, so they have longer feathers. However, if they get a homozygous dominant or a heterozygous genotype, they're going to have shorter um, feathering. So you're going to see two phenotypes uh, in males, just depending on what genotype they have. And in our females, it if they have one of the three genotypes, dominant heterozygous or dominant or uh, homozygous recessive, they're going to look like this no matter what. All right, so we're going to pick up with the rest of Chapter 5's lecture in the next year.